Alright, we're gonna record it and I'm gonna put it on Facebook. How about that? So yeah, welcome uh, everybody to the CAC conference and I really thank uh Lauren for bringing bring me in here and uh, that last presentation was awesome. I'm not gonna have as much scientific as that. I'm more the average Joe weather guy. That's kinda why I think people flock to the web you know, website is just Mike, you know, and uh, and we got a great following online. So, you know, like, like she said, Mike's code page. Check us out, we're like one big family. Uh, it's a lot of fun. This is our season, and uh, we, you know, we're in May. We're, we're getting a lot of talk about tropics. So we're gonna, what I'm gonna do today, we're gonna go into um, a, lot, a lot about hurricanes. Uh, the website is spaghettibottles.com, and uh, maybe give you guys a little bit of information you might not have known about hurricanes and tracking these things, what, what influences on stuff I've learned over the years. Uh, a little bit about myself. In uh, 2004, uh, if anybody lived in Florida, you, you'll remember the storm that we had. Uh, Charlie was the first one. It was coming right towards Tampa Bay. And I struggled to find any information on the internet as far as spaghetti models and, and those cool graphics. You know, it was so, so hard to find. So I made a web page. It was uh, primarily for friends and family. And I wanted just one uh, one stop shop. That's what Jim Cantori calls it. He, he loves the page. Uh, he always calls it the one stop shop for tropics. And it still is today. I have one page. It's one page with all kinds of uh, weather graphics. And when we get a hurricane coming, I try to put everything on there. So that's pretty much what it is today. The local Tampa Bay Times had a cool article on us. Uh, Irma kind of got famous for the wrong reasons when Tampa was uh, getting Irma a couple years ago. So I'm going to talk a little bit again. We're going to go with the spaghetti models. Surge, Sear, uh, Sal, social media, impacts and predictions with you guys in the insurance business. Uh, might be some cool stats you might find fascinating. So, so here we are 16 years later and uh, still doing it. A few pictures of my family with Dennis Phillips. He's uh, ABC Met. We had ABC come out and do a hurricane special at the house. That's pretty cool. Got to meet some hurricane hunters. Um, FEMA actually on the bottom right was pictured using the site. Uh, it's crazy. It's, uh, been a wild ride. I, I'm very humbled by it, and but I love to do it. Even have Fox for they cut in the break during Irma. There, there's a site. So enough about me. So I always ask the kids as when I do the Great American Teachings, what do you guys think spaghetti balls are? And kids get a kick out of that. <laughs> Not those kind of spaghetti. I love that article. Right, I just did one a couple weeks ago. Um, but here's the, the, the cool facts on spaghetti balls. Um, a lot, of, a lot of, you know, we watch these things on TV. A lot of times there's a lot of discussion. They don't even want to put these on the news channels because, you know, some people will mistake them as, oh my God, Hurricane Smart is warming. So it towards me, but they're very fascinating. The NHC uses them. Uh, it's, it's the whole foundation of the tropical season, I've learned. Um, and here's a little bit about them. But we'll just start at the top. You guys are reading along. But each, each one of these little lines on the spaghetti model is a different computer. It's like a brain. Every one of these models has its own way of thinking. Uh, every year they input new data, new new uh, parameters on what each model has. So when you see the whole whole plot of all these models, each one's a little, little bit of a different thing. Just like everybody in this room has a different thought process as what every uh, model that you see on, on the screen is basically. Um, we have the hurricane hunters are very vital. A lot of times you get spaghetti models early in the season out in the Atlantic. Uh, until you have a true center of circulation, the spaghetti models mean nothing, so always remember that. So the hurricane hunters actually fly in and get a true center of circulation, uh, then the models don't mean much. The uh, the data is constantly fed in these things. You get new model runs every six hours, so if you're a junkie like me, uh, my clock is set every six hours to check the new GFS in Euro. Uh, these models are pretty awesome as far as what they, what they do. They actually look at past hurricane data. They look at current data, they look at future data. So all these parameters are going in. And of course, Irma, if you lived in Irma, this was uh, both the National Hurricane Center is to your left and the straight models to your right. And the, the cone that the NHC uses usually a blend of all the different models. And on September 7th, it was going right towards, a lot of you guys live on the other coast, I'm told, um, created a you know, mass evacuation on September 7th. Ultimately, that didn't pan out, and here's why. So here's spaghetti models, they change daily. This is what's fascinating. That's why everybody in the world watches the news to see what the new models are. So as we watch this Hurricane Irma, uh, two years ago, 2017, as it was coming towards South Florida, September 5th, I kind of circled, the majority of the models had it missing the East Coast, so there wasn't a lot of you know news coverage on it yet. September 6th came around, uh, boom, we had a huge widespread. We had outliers to the West Coast, Florida, East Coast, 
uh, basically computers don't know what they were doing. September 7th is when all of a sudden we had these huge evacuations going on down in Miami and Lauderdale because a whole bunch of the models started predicting, you know, East Coast of Florida. Evacuations came. September 8th came along, and guess what? The models shifted a little bit more towards Naples area. And then September 9th, it actually went more to the West Coast. And as I put a little star, ultimately September 8th was the day that uh, the most correct on the 3A models. So again, you know, models bounce back and forth on the news. You'll hear about flip flopping. They went show white perfect. The models back, you know, they go back and forth, changing weather, high pressure, low pressures. Can't focus on just one line. Um, you have ensembles of each run. Whoa, look at that. We lost the uh, connection there. But uh, we'll get IT here. But every every uh, spaghetti model, like the Euro and the GFS. Um, has ensembles, which are very important now that you can start to hear a lot, a lot about the news talking about these ensemble models. And then again, the NAC uses these spaghetti models in predicting their uh, forecasts. So, and then of course last year, uh, we're going to go in, as, as the last presentation did with Michael and uh, Florence was a big storm with a lot of pluses and negatives on how they tracked it. We got all kinds of cool stuff now. So I had a lot of people want drunk donkey shirts. Does everybody go drinking after this? Play golf? <laughs> Is that what you were waiting for? Heartbeat. Well, no, the last. Look at that. <laughs> Just like uh, computer models, all technology can be wrong too. So. All right, so here we go. Let's go to the next slide. Hopefully we get good stuff here. All right, so here's a cool little case study, just uh, going over two different systems that we had, which is always the big debate. The GFS and the European model are the most two common models everybody uses. With Irma, uh, the Euro model had it going out uh, this in Florida, and GFS had it hooking up to Naples back when it was way down by uh, the Dominican Republic in Haiti. Of course, GFS won that one. Then we got Sandy a few years before that, and uh, the GFS had it going out to sea. European had it going up into uh, New Jersey, New York, and it was correct. So at any any given time, any of these models could be correct. There's a lot of other models that we look at, um, and again, any one of these models could be right. That's where if you just start to have a gut instinct on these things, uh, that's kind of what we do on Facebook, and uh, you know nobody's ever. You're always going to be right. You're always going to be wrong. But uh, the European usually is the most correct model, but as you saw with Irma, it wasn't. Pretty, pretty bad, that's fascinating. So here's some good video coverage I found on uh, Michael. So you guys might not have seen some of this stuff. This is one of our uh, storm chasers. Let's see if it comes up here. As our last presenter mentioned, there's there's a lot of storm chasers going out of these systems now. This is as uh, Michael came in short, Mexico Beach area. And just starting on slot of the surge here coming up. Alright, 
let's get into some names here real quick. Everybody likes the names. Uh, somebody mentioned Wilma the year, of, uh, Wilma after the Greek uh, W year. We go to the Greek alphabet. Uh, 28 names were used in 2005. We only had four in uh, 1983. Of course, no names are retired. That's determined on the amount of damage these uh, swarms produce. Of course, Michael and Florence were retired last year. And uh, the names do get repeated every six years. I always think that's fascinating. So it's, it's uh, a reoccurring pattern of names. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, kids definitely like it. Uh, I always put on the bottom, are you going to be in trouble with a storm or hurricane? People seem to think that's uh, pretty cool. <laughs> and here's your total strikes in Florida. That's a cool little graphic just showing you the, the main areas that have been impacted over the last 100 years. Um, the east coast of Florida obviously has had a tremendous amount of more, more storms come their way, and that's mainly because of the storms coming in off of Africa, the Cape Verde season. So, always like to show the name. All right, so here we go. Let's get into the peak activity. We have, um, we're in Bang. The last four years, we've had a named storm in Bang, and uh, I definitely predict we're going to see something the next two weeks. The uh, frontal systems are coming down from Texas, and we get low pressures and develop in the Gulf. And typically, like I said, the last four years, we've seen a, a named storm, so I, I would not think it. It would be uncommon to see one pop up. It's uh, you know June 1st, the official date. Of course, the uh, peak season, August, September, October, that's when the water is the hottest and the shear is the lowest. And uh, if we were to get anything early in the season, it's usually a big rain event. Um, but the date thing is kind of, uh, I'm not really sold on the whole date thing, especially now that we're getting all these systems in May. All right, let's get that one. It's a little bit long here. This is, uh, these are some factors in the hurricanes that uh, I always find pretty, Intriguing. Uh, a couple things. We're going to go to three things. One, we're starting with wind shear. Wind shear you hear a lot about in the news. Uh, currently, this is a snapshot on the upper left. This is what the Atlantic looks like right now in the Gulf. All the reds is 40, 50, 60 knots this year. That's why we don't have big, strong hurricanes this time of the year. What you need um, on these systems on the bottom right, or bottom left and bottom right, you have vertical stacking of these systems. Uh, they actually, like I put the little toy that a lot of us grew up playing. Uh, the little ring, ring game, but you have all these different levels of the atmosphere. And in order to have a real potent hurricane like Michael, you need to have low shear. Uh, the system might have vorticity on a lower level, like 850 millibar, mid, uh, middle level, but it, if it doesn't have upper level winds supporting it, we don't get these massive major hurricanes. Uh, this time of the year, we have a lot of shear in, in the atmosphere. That's why we don't get these big, strong hurricanes. Now, there's a snapshot of Irma back in September, and you can see that the shear is uh, really reduced. It's relaxed. That's why we get these big systems and then of course the water is the hottest that time of the year. So it, take, it takes a, a lot in the upper atmosphere to support a major hurricane. Uh, this time of year, it's really why we don't have strong systems is because of the upper level winds in the Gulf. The other thing that controls uh, hurricanes is Africa. Uh, this is a phenomenon that's becoming more and more learned at every season. Uh, the picture on the upper right is in that actual from Go satellite. It's uh, the dust coming in off of Africa. That blows into the middle atmosphere and it actually dries up the system. Uh, it's carried all the way across the Atlantic and then actually Florida. And a lot of the newscasters show the uh, dust tracker because it makes really uh, beautiful sunsets at night. Um, a lot of people in the islands talk about the, the Saharan dust that live down in the uh, Caribbean. But this dust actually chokes hurricanes uh, because it dries up the middle atmosphere. And, and to have a strong hurricane, you need to have a moist middle atmosphere. And if, again, on the upper uh, left there, you see Irma. Irma came across Africa, very low uh, dust in the atmosphere, and then a snapshot of, of what heavy sound looks like. That. The yellows and oranges are it's actually particles of dust in the, in the upper atmosphere, and uh, it kind of chokes off systems. So you'll hear a lot about the Saharan air layer and uh, how it controls these Cape Verde systems that actually start in Africa. And that, and that season usually starts August, uh, September, October. We start to see these waves rolling off of Africa, make their way across like Florence did last year and affect us. Uh, another thing you, you hear a lot about in the news is water temps. There's a couple, uh, two different ways to look at water temps. One, of course, is your sea surface temperature, uh, SST, and I put the graphics showing the different timestamps throughout the year. The other thing that's really the main focus on water temps is the uh, ocean heat content, and that's the, the amount of heat that goes down into the, the ocean waters, because it's not so much the surface temperature, which you can see are kind of warm even this time of year, it's how deep the water goes. 
And as these systems uh, start churning up the ocean, they pull up water called uprising, and uh, that's what uh, enables the system to keep fueling itself. Without deep, warm water, these systems uh, dissipate. And, it, and the most fa fascinating thing I've been reading about, and it definitely happened last year, these warm water eddies, which you can kind of see on the uh, bottom right, there's a little patch up around Cuba there. That's a warm eddy that comes in its Gulf Stream. And it, it breaks off in the summertime. And, and we had one of these off of uh, Texas when uh, we had Harvey. And Harvey actually just stopped off the coast. And it didn't move much. It just kept, you know, a strong hurricane. Well, it kept pulling up the water from, from deep down in the Gulf. And it was one of these warm water eddies. And, it, you know, and Michael last year, unfortunately, hit one of these eddies just off the uh, coast of Florida. You can kind of see it in the upper upper left there. And it fueled Michael and it allowed it you know, extreme uh, intensification there. So the ocean heat content is, is more of a big player than uh, sea surface temps when uh, looking at hurricanes. All right, so just real quick, you know, hurricanes need warm, deep water, moist atmosphere, light upper winds, no land, and they need lots of time to develop, usually a few days. Um, the main threats is always water related. I got a graphic here showing storm deaths. Almost 80% of your deaths with hurricanes is water related. Storm surge, inland, inland flooding, and um, surf. So the wind is never really a factor with, with human life. It's, it's the water. You know, they say you can you can board up from the wind, but you can run from the water. That's always the uh, that's always the sand. So of course, power outages, water spouts, tornadoes. And you get these tornadoes and water spouts embedded in these systems. So you know, even though you might be on the northeast side, which this is the strong side, you can still get these these tornadoes and with the system. Um, and of course, they always say recurrence. I always joke, you know, who the heck's swimming in a hurricane? And then the uh, main threat, obviously, is media hype. And there's never uh, any lack of that. All right, so this is a new graphic I just did. This is it's kind of fascinating. But sometimes these, these systems don't play by the rules, and that's kind of where I fit in because I, you know, as, as much science as you can put into hurricanes and storms, you can always um, they're always going to fool you. So we had Florence last year, which formed way out in the Atlantic, and it was under. Um, immense shear, which I circled on the bottom left there. The red area is 40, 50, 60 knots a shear. Florence went north into that, formed into a Cat 4 hurricane. Uh, there was dry air in the middle one, and yellow as the water vapor leaf. That's the amount of dry air in the atmosphere. It was around heavy dust. Spaghetti models had most of them going back up to uh, the sea. And then the water temp was only 78 degrees when it formed into a Category 4 system. So um, that's why people love hurricanes, because you just never know what's going to happen. These things pop up. Michael last year out of the blue. So even though we think, you know, we know what controls these things, you have a system like Florence last year that did not play by the rules. Okay, here's a cool little video on storm surge. That was kind of what we were looking at in the last video, or our last presentation. Let's see if it shows up here. determine which areas may need to be evacuated. 
When a hurricane storms our coast, it's important to be aware of all the dangers. As a reminder, emergency managers want us to run from the water and hide from the wind. Don't take unnecessary risks during a storm. Conditions can change in the blink of an eye. <laughs> storm surge. <laughs> okay, that was pretty good. Um, yeah, so again, the, the water is everything where the, uh, the wind is, you know, the building is getting better now. Uh, so it seems like water is definitely the biggest threat. So here are a couple things on storm, storm surge that I got interested with interesting graphics for you here. Uh, here's a question to think about. I live in Tampa Bay. Um, but as, as we heard in the last presentation, hurricanes spin counterclockwise. And that affects greatly on who gets the surge and who doesn't. Uh, you saw with Michael uh, to the west of the, the landfall, we had almost negative storm surge, of course. Uh, so again, it all depends on what the eye comes in. And uh, I got some cool pictures here, real, real pictures using my daughter, showing us just the, what, what Tampa Bay would be like with surge, with the system to the north and uh, to the south. And there we go, there's my little model, Emily. So last, uh, let's see, two years ago, Hurricane Irma, we had the most craziest thing happened in Tampa Bay. As Irma was down by the Bahamas, there was all these reports down in the Bahamas of the water just dis disappeared. And it was all, you know, we were getting these pictures on Twitter all the way up through Naples, and I thought they were fake. And then all of a sudden, somebody posted a picture from Tampa Bay, and, and literally all the water in the bay uh, was rushed out. Um, this was our pier where I live, and we walked out, you know, half a quarter of a mile where it was completely uh, drained. And that was because Irma was to our south and the motion here with the arrow, that was the immense winds that we had ro rotating counterclockwise. It actually blew all the water out of the bay. Um, and and uh, that was way down when it was you know, down by Naples. Now another hurricane we had that was uh, a, couple, a year before that, Hurricane Hermine was to North Tampa and it landed in uh, Panhandle. It was the opposite effect. It actually blew water into the bay. Uh, it wasn't that strong of a hurricane, but still that's the same here. And we had, you know, about a six, seven, eight foot difference there uh, because of the Hermine actually blew the water in from, from the Gulf into the Tampa Bay. And that, of course, is the biggest threat is the direction of a hurricane if it were to hit where we live. Um, so that was pretty cool. My daughter is the, uh, my official model. She hates it when I show that, but she's not here, so I can make fun of her. But uh, here's these uh, slosh maps that they talk about in the video. They're very fa fascinating. You can find them on wherever you guys live. I just use Tampa uh, this is where I live. Um, but these, these are real life situations that where we where I live, there's there's Emily again, but we have the, these signs all around Tampa Bay. Um, this one's a mile from our house that shows you worst case scenario. We have one that's uh, by race uh, Tampa Bay Downs, it's literally uh, 10 feet high that the storm surge could meet. And the slosh models actually um, show that to be the worst case scenario on a category four system on high tide, Pinellas County would be an island. And uh, the, that's real life scenarios, and that's why they, they did this mass evacuation last year when Michael was, or uh, when it was this to our south. So you know the, these things are uh, incredible models. The shallow shelf, I noted, uh, that's why Katrina had a, an, an enormous surge was it was a slow moving system, and as the shelf gets shallower um, or shallower off the coast, you get this enormous water push up. Now the other coast, like where some of y'all live in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, you won't get as much surge because of the deep shelf. The water doesn't have time to push up. So the, the shallow waters definitely influence the surge values and, and the speed of the system. That's why Mike, I think, didn't have as much surge because it was such a fast moving system. It didn't have time to build up that water. Just like you do in a pool or a bathtub. You know, you, you start pushing up water and it starts building up while Michael was moving kind of fast and it didn't have time to do like a Katrina type. Scenarios. So these are online. Just uh, Google NOAA slosh models. You can see where you live and get an idea of what's the uh, worst case scenario. Um, a couple things here too, which I've been really pushing a lot online. Whoops, did the switch there. We're stuck again. Oh, oh here we go. I grew up on. See if I can do it here. Where's my tech guy? <laughs> He's gonna be working for the drink.
All right. Okay, so I've, I've been a big promoter online about these watches and warnings. Uh, the NHC graphic that we all grew, grew, grew up with is to your right. And with Michael last year, this, these are Michael graphics. It, there's such a uh, misunderstanding as far as who, who's going to get these systems inland. And I don't think they talk about this enough, especially with um, Charlie. Everybody I know in the world evacuated Tampa, went to Orlando, and they got hit by the hurricane. So, you know, they, they actually, you know, tower was out for weeks because um, they didn't talk about it. They said evacuate, they say go to Orlando. So, uh, the NHC still puts out these graphics. The same graphic, uh, that was Weather Channel actually to the, to the uh, left, but it shows all these counties. I mean, we had category three winds all the way to Georgia, Alabama. Cotton fields, pecan farms were completely uh, devastated. And though those people were, I don't think they really realized this was coming. Uh, Albany, I drove through Albany, Georgia on the way home to Talladega, and I couldn't believe it. Albany is way up off the coast. So these, you know, these graphics to think about the inland the threats are definitely um, not talked about enough. And another thing the uh, NHC doesn't do, they have these little time stamps with the M's and the H's. Uh, they don't really ever show the public what is going to be a landfall. And there were a few graphics uh, leading up to Michael that they showed the H just offshore, which probably was a hurricane a little bit farther south, but they didn't show the potential. They showed the, the hurricane inland. They didn't show we had a major hurricane at landfall. So sometimes the public, I think, is uh, you know mis misconceived on what, what the actual landfall potential is. So that's something to take into account. And then the last thing is the, the eye of the, the cone. They say never focus on the eye, the line. The eye rarely follows that center center line. Um, it can fall anywhere in that graphic the NHC puts out. So they get a lot of criticism for that. So just remember that the eye can go anywhere in an NHC cone. And again, the northeast side of the system is always the worst. So if the you know, system falls to the, to the right, you're going to get a lot more impacts that aren't even in the cone. So that cone can be really deceiving, for sure. All right, so. All right, so watches and warnings. This is a good one. My wife always laughs because she still doesn't know the difference between a watch and a warning. Uh, you can kind of get, get an idea, but the general public, again, they, the watch and warning is, you know, very mis misleading. I don't know if it's the WWF, but hurricane watches uh, could, could happen. Warning, it is going to happen. And the only reason I put this on here with severe thunderstorms and tornadoes is a tornado warning is it, it is happening right now versus a hurricane warning it is going to happen and they then the NHC only lists these things 40 hours out for a watch and 36 hours uh, for a warning so it's good to refresh your, you know on that especially if you got people you're educating uh what you know making sure they know the difference between a watch and warning because and then this witch graphic they use all, all the time uh, i always think it's funny but the you know wizard of oz graphic i guess that means a watch means she might be a witch and then a warning she is a witch <laughs> All right, so here's a cool little thing here. We'll show this is all the different uh, damages on categories. I found this one. Um, Even if you don't meet the eye of a hurricane, tropical storm force winds are nothing to mess around with. This is what Clearwater Beach felt during Hurricane Irma. Sustained winds from 39 to 73 miles per hour. Gusts over 100. You want to be careful of flying debris and down power lines. At 74 miles per hour, you're dealing with a Category 1, like most of Tampa Bay did during Hurricane Irma. Well-constructed <coughs> homes can see damages to roof and vinyl siding. Extensive tree damage posed an additional risk to you, your home, and your car. Your screen exposure could come tumbling down, and the power grid should see major disruptions. Storm surge is also possible, turning streets into rivers. At 96 miles per hour, you get a tattoo like Hurricane Francis, which hit near West Palm Beach. When the wind gets this intense, cosmetic damage is the least of your worries. Falling trees and flying debris become the deadliest threats to both you and your home. Tree branches become projectiles. If a window or a door gets blown out of an older home, the winds can rush inside and blow the roof right off. You can also expect significant storm surge in some places, enough to put some of Florida's coastal state underwater. At 111 miles per hour, you've got a major Category 3 hurricane, like when Katrina hit New Orleans. Mobile homes don't stand a chance, and older homes without a roof to collapse in upon themselves. Even newer construction is now at risk, especially siding, doors, and roofs. 130 miles per hour marks a Category 4 storm, like Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, which 
Charlie in Southwest Florida. Blowing open doors and smashing windows can lead to even new homes failing. Power pole could be uprooted, snapped, or down. And even if your home survives the wind, deadly storm surge can leave it uninhabitable. Not only will there be no water or power, but you may not have access to the area for a while. And if a storm produces sustained wind of 157 miles per hour, it becomes a Category 5, like Hurricane Andrew in 1992. Catastrophic damage is guaranteed, with total destruction in some places. The area will likely be uninhabitable for months. The good news is the eye of a hurricane packing these most powerful winds is usually localized. But the bad news is that a major hurricane, even if you dodge the eye, Damaging winds can extend hundreds of miles in all directions. Yeah, we still got people living in tents in, uh, up in uh, the Panhandle right now. So. Terrible. All right, so here's some uh, stats maybe you need in the earth insurance industry you guys might find that fascinating. I am not a uh, global warming guy. I don't, I'm not a scientist, but the facts don't lie. The uh, Growth, uh, major, major hurricanes are growing through the years. This is a graphic from 1970 to 2010. The trend is more major hurricanes. The uh, sea surface temp is definitely rising. That's science, PMI, 1900 to 2020, the middle graphic, and then the uh, global temperatures are rising. So I think we're gonna get these strong systems. I mean, the weather just seems, you know, you talk to my mom and dad, or 80, they, everybody thinks the weather is more extreme now. Uh, you know, we're, it's definitely not getting any better. So we're going to be in this industry dealing with this stuff that does appear. Here's, you know, here's some costs real quick. Uh, Florence and Michael, 24 billion. Michael was 25 billion. I thought they would have topped a little bit higher compared to some other storms, but you know, some of the data is still coming in. Irma was 50 billion. Uh, Sandy, 71 billion. Tropical storms. Thought that was interesting. Allison was 8.5 billion uh, impact, and uh, tropical storm we 2.8 billion. So even though we can get a tropical storm in May, we can definitely get uh, some serious claims and. Uh, some damages, so it doesn't have to be a hurricane, that's for sure. Uh, oceanfront property is another cool graphic. Coastal limit is increasing. Uh, 60, uh, 52 percent of, of all Americans are living uh, on a coastal county right now, so over half of America is living uh, near the coast. Um, of course, that might be California and, and whatnot, but and I have all the, all the hurricanes for the last 150 years. You can see nobody's uh, safe, um, everybody's gonna get, get a storm sometime along, so you know. Coastal living is increasing, that's the point of that one. Social media is the last thing here, real, real interesting. Uh, I thought it was really crazy, but 62% um, of Americans now get their news from uh, social media. Uh, Reddit, 70%, Facebook, 66 Twitter, 59%. Uh, that's uh, definitely scary. And the, the meteorologist on TV, uh, there's a cool article there, somebody wrote um, <laughs> a couple years ago. But this, this is, my Facebook, and this is kind of funny, it says my wife has a new man in her life, his name is Mike. She met him on the internet, he even has his own Facebook page, it's called Mike's Twitter page. He's a lot like me, she never sees him, he spends most of his time noodling on the computer, one-way conversation, he rambles aimlessly, blah, blah, blah. But that's, that's what people like, God, man, it's a new world we're in. Um, social, you know, media, that people like no hype, calming tone, the public likes to see all these scenarios, they can't give these out on your, you know, six o'clock news. Um, and they want, want it now. It's something that you know social media is able to do that uh, news can't. Um, here's a funny little graphic I posted the other day. This, this is why the NAC and others are worried about people like me. I posted this picture on um, uh, Hurricane Outlook. I put zero to 20 names. Zero, I mean, it was just me having a few beers one night laughing. But you know, that, that's pretty much predicting hurricanes. You can't really go off of that. But in one day, uh, it, it reached 75,000 people on Facebook. It, you know, 1,000 likes, 100 comments. So stuff like that can spread negatively, and of course you see that all the time. So that's one big risk of uh, social media that they can't control right now is what's being spread uh, out there. Do you want to jump through the page? What's that? Do you want to jump through the page? Yeah. What does a hurricane and an ex-wife have in common? What's a hurricane and an ex-wife have in common? One of them's going to get your house. One of them's going to get your house. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> all right. Uh, so this was put out yesterday, actually, by the National Hurricane Center. Uh, they're doing the National Awareness Week this week. Um, hype versus no hype. Uh, I hear this all the time. I'm sure you guys hear it. It's only a uh, Category 1, but simply, uh, you can read the stats here. Since 2010, uh, $103 billion in damages just from Category 1. 
And some of the names, Storms, Isaac, Sandy, uh, Sandy Hermine, Matthew, and even Florence was a one when it hit uh, Carolina. So just because it's category one doesn't mean it can um, not be dangerous. And again, you know, cry wolf syndrome, I mean, that, that it's getting tougher because the media hypes these things up. And uh, when we don't, when it probably doesn't get this death and destruction that they are expecting, then they're not going to leave the next one. And like we saw with Michael, it, it panned out. Um, so it's tough. It's a tough battle. Uh, the last slide I think I got here, this is the season ahead. These are the official predictions from Colorado State. Right on par would be an average 13, uh, five hurricanes. Weather Channel just put theirs out this week. Of course, nobody believes them because they think they're trying to hype uh, viewership. But they, they went kind of high and so did AccuWeather. So I, I totally agree. Um, we're around average. Uh, we're in this El Nino pattern, which is kind of fascinating for us living in the south. When you have cool or warmer Pacific waters, it creates a, a new jet stream that comes through the uh, Caribbean, and we get these stronger uh, type storms coming up through the Gulf, and that's why we're getting all this stormy weather coming up through Louisiana, Florida right now. Because we're in this El Nino pattern, and it creates a wet pattern for us here in Florida, and it creates a lot of storms. It also creates a lot of shear in the Caribbean. The one graphic I have here, the blue line is above average. That's why we have a lot of shear right now. So the chances of a strong system forming are very low. Uh, but that's, you know, LU is supposed to be weaker in uh, summertime. So that's just this part of the season. Um, water temperatures last year, the big news on the very top, 2018, they were all talking about the cooler Atlantic. It was going to be a slow season. That's all you heard about. Then you have Florence pop out of nowhere. So I don't really buy the water temps. It changes really quick. Um, Two things I noticed with the media is the, the hype. You know, Florence, they talked about this storm for weeks. It was peak of season. I swear it seemed like fall and football, as soon as it turns October 1st, nobody talks about hurricanes. And then Michael came up, came around and uh, nobody wanted to talk about hurricanes. He couldn't find it anywhere. And then again, it only takes one, Hurricane Andrew in uh, 1992. Very slow season, and uh, we all know what Andrew did. And there we go. There's the uh, my little Looney Tunes. That's all, folks. Like to thank for claim service. And uh, yeah. Have a good day, any questions?